I'm Pat Doris. Welcome to the story. I hope you had a fun and bounty filled Thanksgiving holiday. It's good to have you here. It's good to be back at work. Let's get to it. Tonight we're talking about salmon in the Northwest. It seems like everyone values them and tens of billions of dollars have been sent trying to help them recover from the impact of dams and development along our rivers. But also along the way, it's possible that another factor found almost everywhere in the Northwest is playing a really harmful role. And that is our big story tonight. A few years ago, scientists in western Washington made a really surprising discovery. It was more of a hunch at first, and then they nailed it. They suspected something among the thousands of chemicals found in local streams was proving lethal to the salmon. During the pandemic, while most of us were thinking about human health, a team was able to link a single chemical from tires, yes, regular car and truck tires, to the, to the decline of coho salmon. Angelique Cahede from our sister station in Seattle has our story. This beaker contains little bits of tire. Now, it may not seem like much. After all, we use tires in everyday life, but we now know inside contains a lethal chemical responsible for killing up to 90% of coho salmon right here in Longfellow Creek alone. Right now in America, almost every tire changed. Every road driven, every playground built is contributing to decades worth of coho salmon dying. It's one of the top five like most toxic chemicals to aquatic organisms that people have ever reported. 6-PPD quinone is a toxin produced when the common tire preservative 6-PPD mixes with oxygen. As tires age, the rubber starts to peel off, leaving bits and pieces in their path. When it rains, anything that doesn't soak into soil becomes stormwater pollution, eventually ending up in local waterways where every fall coho salmon return to spawn. They're literally soaking up this chemical that's interfering with how their brains work, and then they're dying before they can get to that next part of the, the creek in order to, to lay their eggs. Sean Dixon is the executive director of Puget Soundkeeper Alliance. With the help of hundreds of volunteers, they've been tracking declining coho salmon populations. First, bringing their data to the University of Washington, Tacoma, where scientist Ed Kaloje and his team worked to narrow down the thousands of chemicals found in stormwater pollution to one. I think literally it was December 12th, 2019. Jenny was like, hey, I think I know what it is. We're just, we're just trying to size sort this Chinook. The team brought a sample to Jen McIntyre over at Washington State University in Puyallup, where 6-PPD quinone was put to the test. The fish would start to come to the surface of the water. They'd start swimming at the surface of the water. They'd start to lose equilibrium and swim on their sides and upside down and eventually settle to the bottom of the tank and die. Scientists call the discovery a career defining moment. Relief and excitement. Pointing to the critical role coho play in maintaining healthy freshwater ecosystems. But the excitement soon faded with the question, now that we know what's killing them, what do we do about it? It's one to two percent by weight of every tire on the planet that's been made for 60 years. The U.S. Tire Manufacturers Association addresses 6PPD on its website, saying in part the chemical adds to driver safety and that more research is needed. But even if they stopped using the chemical, advocates say it could be decades before 6PPD is completely eradicated. We have to be walking and chewing gum at the same time. Data from WSU shows that when stormwater pollution goes through green infrastructure, like a rain garden, it filters the chemical out. Yeah. Sean and his team are now fighting for more green treatment solutions near urban creeks, pointing to permits that direct how cities and states handle new toxins in stormwater. The permits today, under the law today, say if you've got a problem, start figuring out how to solve it. Puget Soundkeeper sent intent to sue notices to five cities, including Seattle, Burien, Mukilteo, SeaTac, and Normandy Park, for not complying with permits. But Sean says the goal is to work with cities, understanding that solutions are expensive. These folks know that this is a problem, want to help solve it, but this is one issue among many for, for most of these towns. 
The hope now is for a stronger response from the state. A petition was sent to the Washington State Department of Ecology asking for more action near Longfellow Creek in West Seattle, which has seen pre-spawn mortality rates nearing 90 percent. A response from the state was filed saying in part, the science is clearly making a case that 6-PPD quinone kills. At this time, we do not believe that a site-specific adaptive management effort is the most appropriate or necessary response. And so if the community hears a little bit about it. I asked Jeff Kililea, who works with the Department of Ecology, for more context. Is there a reason why, if we know that there are certain creeks that are being targeted, that the state is rejecting site-specific solutions? This problem, on the other hand, is widespread and ubiquitous throughout the Pacific Northwest. He says they're figuring out how to best use funds received from the legislature to address multiple sites and researching ways to ensure solutions put in place today are effective in the long term. Certainly agree that actions are required uh, to address and install treatment where it's needed. We only disagree on, on the timing and the mechanisms for that treatment. But it's time, Sean says, that poses the greatest risk. That's something that our salmon can't handle. That's something that our tribal communities don't deserve. That's something that our communities uh, can't wait for. We would love to hear your thoughts on this story. Please let us know what you're thinking about it. Send us an email to thestory at kgw.com or call and leave a voicemail, 503-226-5090. And that brings us to an article that we think is certainly worth your time. It comes from a partnership between OPB and ProPublica titled, Unchecked Pollution is Contaminating the Salmon that Pacific Northwest Tribes Eat. And the subheadline says it all. For decades, the U.S. government has failed to test for dangerous chemicals and metals in fish. So we did, and what we found was alarming for tribes. It was written by Tony Schick at OPB and Maya Miller with ProPublica. They focused on Columbia River Basin and a region that's contaminated by more than a century of agricultural and industrial pollution. There are an estimated 68,000 native people living in the river basin today. They are in a tough spot when it comes to contaminated fish. They're weighing unknown health risks against their sacred practices passed down through the centuries. So OPB and ProPublica work to reveal some of the unknown health risks with this story. They bought 50 salmon from native fishermen in the region and paid to have them tested at a certified lab for 13 metals and two classes of chemicals known to be present in the Columbia. And they found the native tribes face a disproportionate risk of toxic exposure through their most important food. Here's what the testing showed. You can see the average diet of the general population there around three eight ounce servings of salmon each month. The average tribal member eats closer to 16 of those servings a month, and then a high-end diet of a tribal member would be closer to 60 servings a month. Well, the lab testing showed concentrations of two chemicals that federal and state health agencies deem unsafe when consumed at that mid-level, about 16 times a month. That's how many times most tribal members, you'll recall, eat salmon. The chemicals are mercury, where there's a risk at just eight servings a month, and then also PCBs, which are, after prolonged exposure, can damage the immune and reproductive systems and a lot more, very dangerous. Certainly some concerning numbers, but the next question is, okay, so what's being done about it? Well, there appeared to be a breakthrough here in Oregon back in 2011. That's when the state adopted new water quality standards to protect tribal people's health. The state said it would restrict the amount of chemicals released by industry and wastewater plants so that people could eat more fish with less risk. Well, okay, that's great. But what sounded like a good idea was not exactly followed through on. The state struggled to ensure that the polluters actually met the new lower limits. The Oregon Department of Environmental Quality said it just didn't have enough staff to keep pollution permits updated, rendering the new standards pretty much obsolete. In this OPB story that we're telling you about, they asked the state DEQ for evidence if the new standards actually improved water quality. And DEQ basically responded with, uh, we don't really have any evidence. In the story, they say, DEQ wrote the agency does not have significant amounts of data on the concentration of bioaccumulative pollutants in the Columbia River and therefore does not have any trend information. So basically, there's no telling if it's done anything to help. 
And the journalists for this story say the contamination of the water and fish could even be worse than what they found. And that's because they say things like pesticides and flame retardants could also be adding to the contamination, but those pollutants were not included in the testing because, well, it costs too much. And it doesn't look like they tested for that 6-PPD quinone either that we talked about in the first story. But something could be done in the near term. In August, the EPA received $79 million to reduce toxic pollution in the Columbia River as part of President Biden's bipartisan infrastructure law. That's the most money ever dedicated to reducing contamination in the Columbia. But the tribes and the advocates say that is just a fraction of what they need. There's a lot more at the OPB and ProPublica article that we didn't get into here on this show, so be sure to check it out. It's well worth your time. You won't be sorry. Now to another hot topic, shoplifting. It is rampant in the greater Portland area. It also gives us an excuse to show you this video again. Some of the wildest we've shot in recent memory. The driver is a woman in a stolen truck trying to get away from Portland police after shoplifting at a store at Mall 205. Police threw down spike strips to stop her, which worked as she careened down the block. She was arrested and released, but she was not done. A couple weeks later, she was arrested and jailed briefly in Washington County for shoplifting. And tonight, she's jailed in Multnomah County, this time because her parole officer said enough. She'd violated part of yet an earlier parole for an earlier arrest. Pretty sure that part that she violated was about not committing new crimes. We're not using her name, but we did want to bring you this follow-up because she told our Kyla Boshi that she stole to feed a drug habit, and we believe she's just one of many in the same situation. The repeat pattern of arrests of hers and others gives you an idea of the impact even one person can have on our community. In that earlier case, the one with the parole, she was ordered to take part in drug, alcohol, and mental health screening. It's unclear whether she actually did. Hopefully this time, she'll get the help that she needs. And many of you also wrote in last week to tell us that you're not happy that the Multnomah County District Attorney's Office prosecutes less than half the misdemeanor theft cases like shoplifting that Portland Police bring them, 46% to be exact. Clackamas County prosecutes 84% of those cases. Washington County prosecutes 93%. Multnomah County DA Mike Schmidt told us the lower number is the result of a lack of evidence. Well, here's some of your comments. Diane wrote in to say, when laws are allowed to be broken, especially laws that harm other people, society will break down. It's inevitable. We are living in capricious times and I hope we have time to get to right the ship. Andrew commented, the word is out. There's very little that will happen if you shoplift or commit any number of crimes. Enough already, do your job, Mike. Kim from Longview wants us to know shoplifting is not just happening in the greater Portland area. She wrote, I have twice witnessed shoplifting theft events at my local Fred Meyer store in Longview. Over the last few months, once the thieves took a whole basket, threw most of it into a waiting truck. Yesterday, a guy was putting a bunch of items in his reusable bag and walked out. I thought about confronting him, but was afraid, and he went out before I could find an employee. Bottom line is that I know this must be a fraction of daily thefts, and I understand why prices are increasing as they are. It breaks my heart that this is so rampant. And finally, getting back to the Portland area, Terry wrote, generally, I agree with Mike Schmidt's prosecution philosophy. However, practically, it's just not working. Thanks to all of you who took time to write in or call and share your thoughts on all this. Please keep your comments coming. If you have more, our email again is thestory at kgw.com or call our phone number 503-226-5090. Still ahead tonight on The Story, a big hurdle this week for Portland City Council. A vote is expected on how to fund the mayor's plan to tackle the homeless crisis. There's no issue more critical to Portlanders right now than addressing homelessness. The mayor has said his widespread ban on camping can begin once the funding is in place. But where's the money going to be coming from? That's next, when the story returns.
And now to our homeless crisis. On Wednesday, Portland City Council is expected to vote on how they will pay for the mayor's homeless plan. That plan includes banning unsanctioned camping over an 18 month period and instead building six designated camping sites instead. And as Blair Best reports, much of the plan now hangs on whether funding is approved. About two weeks ago, City Council discussed how they would fund this plan, but ultimately pushed the vote until after the holiday. They're expected to vote on the funding this Wednesday, which is huge since we've been hearing from the mayor that once funding is in place, then parts of this plan can begin, such as that widespread ban on camping. Yet Council still has quite a few hoops to jump through. It's been just over a month since Mayor Ted Wheeler unveiled his sweeping plan to tackle homelessness in the Rose City. The magnitude and the depth of the homeless crisis in our city is nothing short of a humanitarian catastrophe. He proposed a five part plan, which council passed in early November. Part of the plan includes banning unsanctioned camping over an 18 month period and building six homeless campuses instead. There, the homeless will have access to food, case managers, along with mental health and substance abuse treatment. There will also be on site security, among other things. There's no issue more critical to Portlanders right now than addressing homelessness. One of the big questions, how will the city pay for it? This package allocates approximately $30 million to the commitments council made on November 3rd when we passed the affordable housing and homelessness resolution package. Mayor Wheeler is proposing several changes to the budget, which council is expected to vote on later this week. The changes include more than $4 million as down payment to build the large camping sites, $750,000 for private security in the surrounding neighborhoods, and more than $12 million to run the sites. These allocations are a down payment on that work, and they demonstrate the city's commitment to clearing the path for accelerated production of affordable housing and better connecting homeless individuals to services, employment, and diversion programs. The city is also planning to use extra money they had set aside, as well as money from the American Rescue Plan, and taking $8 million from the amount they give the county's Joint Office of Homeless Services each year. It's going to take commitment from all of us to do the hard work that lies ahead. Another big unanswered question is where these sites will be located. Now, council agrees that they need to be dispersed throughout the city and near public transit. Yet somehow they need to be distanced from residential areas, schools and business districts. Now, we talked with Portlanders last week and many of them said they would welcome one of these large camps in their neighborhood. There's no set date yet on when these locations will be announced. Blair Best, KGW News. Thanks, Blair. The Joint Office of Homeless Services that Blair mentioned, by the way, could lose even more money that they usually get from the city, depending on how a county vote goes next month. That vote deals with spending more dollars for eviction protection services here in Portland. Here's Blair again to explain that. Hey, Pat, just wanted to add one piece of information to this story. You heard that part of the plan is taking $8 million from the annual allotment the city gives to the Joint Office of Homeless Services, which is run by Multnomah County, and using that $8 million to fund part of this plan. Now, there's also another piece to this. They're asking Multnomah County to pay $15 million for eviction protection services in Portland. Now, the county is expected to vote on that piece in December, and the city is saying that if they don't pass that, they'll take an additional $7 million from the annual allotment they give to the Joint Office of Homeless Services and put that towards eviction protection and legal defense services here in Portland. All right, thanks, Blair. The city very concerned about eviction protections. Still to come on the story, from history in the gorge to some unforgettable moments in the gridiron in Corvallis, there was plenty to keep the KGW team busy over the weekend. In case you were gorging on Thanksgiving leftovers and weren't paying attention, we have a look at what you may have missed. That's coming up next.
Nech Pachwai, Ink Nashwaneksha Karina Miller. My name is Karina Miller and I grew up here on the Warm Springs Indian Reservation. Karina Miller has been an enrolled member of the Warm Springs, Wasco, and Yakima tribes all her life. Now, she's also the chair of the Columbia River Gorge Commission, the organization that oversees land use policy for some of the Northwest's most exquisite scenery. It's our job to use the management plan to make sure that we're protecting the national scenic area. It's Just the first time the commission has been led by an indigenous person. Ro Miller said she is honored to hold. She's known how special the gorge is since she was a kid. My grandma and my great-grandma fam, Fanny Wahenica, they would specifically take me to the river, take me on just drives, take me to go eat, and talk to me about us needing to have a presence there, about the removal and relocation of our tribe to this area, but that we still had ties back there. It's a rivalry like no other. The Ducks, the Beavers, the 126th meeting. Reeser Stadium charged up. More than 28,000 in the building. The first top 25 matchup between these schools in a decade. A lot on the line for Oregon. A win away from a ticket to Vegas and the Pac-12 championship game. OSU closed the game scoring 21 unanswered points. Comeback complete. Beavers win 38-34. It's a party in Corvallis. Beaver Nation storms the field and there's Benny Beaver crowd surfing. What a night. Five, four, three, two, one, four. Physical, 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 physical. We thought it was time, you know, after COVID and all that, being locked up and it'll be probably, we thought it was a nice thing to do. And seeing the lights light up really gave me hope. Um, that it would be a really wonderful Christmas season and a wonderful 2023. Our own Brittany Falker is doing a wonderful job out there. By the way, if you want to watch the full version of any of those stories, we've got them up now on KGW.com and our KGW YouTube page. And if you missed any of our coverage here on the story, don't worry. We have a free newsletter where you can get all caught up on all our biggest stories of the week. Just scan this QR code using your cell phone's camera. That'll take you to a link to sign up. The newsletter comes to you in your email at the beginning of every week. And we're always reading your emails when they're coming in during the show. And now we want to get to a viewer comment on our big story tonight involving the chemical found in the tires that's killing off salmon. Well, Chris says, more bad chemicals in our life? Why am I not surprised? Great story. When I was a kid in the 60s in the land of 3M, I frequently wondered if the sudden introduction of new synthetic chemicals into the environment was a good idea prior to in-depth analysis of long-term ecosystem impacts. Well, decades later, it's tragic to see that I was asking the right questions, but regulators were evidently less inquisitive. Thanks for your comment, Chris. Keep you sending your questions and comments, Chris and everyone else, to the story at KGW.com. We're going to wrap things up right after this.
It's a wonderful time of the year. The KGW Great Toy Drive is underway. We want to make it easy for you to give. Just head to KGW.com slash toy and click donate cash. If you make a donation online, we'll do the shopping for you. And get this, if you give this week, Regents will double your donation amount for double the toys. Or you can drop off a new unwrapped toy at any IQ Credit Union, Fred Meyer, or local Toyota dealership. Help bring a little joy to local kids this holiday season. And that's the end of our show. Thanks so much for watching. And remember the story, our story,